The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements by Eric Hoffer Man would fain be great and sees that he is little, would fain be happy and sees that he is miserable, would fain be perfect and sees that he is full of imperfections, would fain be the object of the love and esteem of men, and sees that his faults merit only their aversion and contempt. The embarrassment wherein he finds himself produces in him the most unjust and criminal passions imaginable, for he conceives a mortal hatred against that truth which blames him and convinces him of his faults. Pascal Pensez And slime they had for mortar. Genesis 2 Preface This book deals with some peculiarities common to all mass movements, be they religious movements, social revolutions, or nationalist movements. It does not maintain that all movements are identical, but that they share certain essential characteristics which give them a family likeness. All mass movements generate in their adherents a readiness to die and a proclivity for united action. All of them, irrespective of the doctrine they preach and the program they project, breed fanaticism, enthusiasm, fervent hope, hatred, and intolerance. All of them are capable of releasing a powerful flow of activity in certain departments of life. All of them demand blind faith and single-hearted allegiance. All movements, however different in doctrine and aspiration, draw their early adherents from the same types of humanity. They all appeal to the same types of mind. Though there are obvious differences between the fanatical Christian, the fanatical Mohammedan, the fanatical nationalist, the fanatical communist, and the fanatical Nazi, it is yet true that the fanaticism which animates them may be viewed and treated as one. The same is true of the force which drives them on to expansion and world dominion. There is a certain uniformity in all types of dedication, of faith, of pursuit of power, of unity, and of self-sacrifice. There are vast differences in the contents of holy causes and doctrines, but a certain uniformity in the factors which make them effective. He, who, like Pascal, finds precise reasons for the effectiveness of Christian doctrine, has also found the reasons for the effectiveness of communist, Nazi, and nationalist doctrine. However different the holy causes people die for, they perhaps die basically for the same thing. This book concerns itself chiefly with the active, revivalist phase of mass movements. This phase is dominated by the true believer, the man of fanatical faith who is ready to sacrifice his life for a holy cause and an attempt is made to trace his genesis and outline his nature. As an aid in this effort, use is made of a working hypothesis, starting out from the fact that the frustrated predominate among the early adherents of all mass movements, and that they usually join of their own accord, it is assumed, one, that frustration of itself, without any proselytizing prompting from the outside, can generate most of the peculiar characteristics of the true believer. Two, that an effective technique of conversion consists basically in the inculcation and fixation of proclivities and responses indigenous to the frustrated mind. To test the validity of these assumptions, it was necessary to inquire into the ills that afflict the frustrated, how they react against them, the degree to which these reactions correspond to the responses of the true believer, and finally the manner in which these reactions can facilitate the rise and spread of a mass movement. It was also necessary to examine the practices of contemporary movements where successful techniques of conversion had been perfected and applied in order to discover whether they corroborate the view that a proselytizing mass movement deliberately fosters in its adherence a frustrated state of mind, and that it automatically advances its interest when it seconds the propensities of the frustrated. It is necessary for most of us these days to have some insight into the motives and responses of the true believer. For though ours is a godless age, it is the very opposite of irreligious. The true believer is everywhere on the march, and both by converting and antagonizing, he is shaping the world in his own image. 
and whether we are to line up with him or against him, it is well that we should know all we can concerning his nature and potentialities. It is perhaps not superfluous to add a word of caution. When we speak of the family likeness of mass movements, we use the word family in a taxonomical sense. The tomato and the nightshade are of the same family, the solonaceae, though the one is nutritious and the other poisonous. They have many morphological, anatomical, and physiological traits in common, so that even the non-botanist senses a family likeness. The assumption that mass movements have many traits in common does not imply that all movements are equally beneficent or poisonous. This book passes no judgments and expresses no preferences. It merely tries to explain, and the explanation, all of them theories, are in the nature of suggestions and arguments, even when they are stated in what seems a categorical tone. I can do no better than quote Montaigne, quote, All I say is by way of discourse, and nothing by way of advice. I should not speak so boldly if it were my due to be believed. End quote. Part 1. The Appeal of Mass Movements The Desire for Change It is a truism that many who join a rising revolutionary movement are attracted by the prospect of sudden and spectacular change in their conditions of life. A revolutionary movement is a conspicuous instrument of change. Not so obvious is the fact that religious and nationalist movements, too, can be vehicles of change. Some kind of widespread enthusiasm or excitement is apparently needed for the realization of vast and rapid change, and it does not seem to matter whether the exhilaration is derived from an expectation of untold riches or is generated by an act of mass movement. In this country, the spectacular changes since the Civil War were enacted in an atmosphere charged with the enthusiasm born of fabulous opportunities for self-advancement. Where self-advancement cannot or is not allowed to serve as a driving force, other sources of enthusiasm have to be found. If momentous changes such as the awakening and renovation of a stagnant society or radical reforms in the character and pattern of life of a community are to be realized and perpetuated, religious, revolutionary, and nationalist movements are such generating plants of general enthusiasm. In the past, religious movements were the conspicuous vehicles of change. The conservatism of a religion, its orthodoxy, is the inert coagulum of a once highly reactive sap. A rising religious movement is all change and experiment, open to new views and techniques from all quarters. Islam, when it emerged, was an organizing and modernizing medium. Christianity was a civilizing and modernizing influence among the savage tribes of Europe. The Crusades and the Reformation both were crucial factors in shaking the Western world from the stagnation of the Middle Ages. In modern times, the mass movements involved in the realization of vast and rapid change are revolutionary and nationalist, singly or in combination. Peter the Great was probably the equal in dedication, power, and ruthlessness of many of the most successful revolutionary or nationalist leaders, yet he failed in his chief purpose, which was to turn Russia into a Western nation. And the reason he failed was that he did not infuse the Russian masses with some soul-stirring enthusiasm. He either did not think it necessary or did not know how to make of his purpose a holy cause. It is not strange that the Bolshevik revolutionaries who wiped out the last of the Tsars and Romanovs should have had a sense of kinship with Peter, a Tsar and a Romanov. For his purpose is now theirs, and they hope to succeed where he failed. The Bolshevik revolution may figure in history as much an attempt to modernize a sixth of the world's surface as an attempt to build a communist economy. The fact that both the French and the Russian revolutions turned into nationalist movements seems to indicate that in modern times, nationalism is the most copious and durable source of mass enthusiasm, and that nationalist fervor must be tapped if the drastic changes projected and initiated by revolutionary enthusiasm are to be consummated. 
One wonders whether the difficulties encountered by the present Labour government in Britain are not partly due to the fact that the attempt to change the economy of the country and the way of life of 49 million people has been initiated in an atmosphere singularly free from fervour, exaltation and wild hope. The revulsion from the ugly patterns developed by most contemporary mass movements has kept the civilized and decent leaders of the Labour Party shy of revolutionary enthusiasm. The possibility still remains that events might force them to make use of some mild form of chauvinism so that in Britain too the socialization of the nation might have as its natural corollary the nationalization of socialism. The phenomenal modernization of Japan would probably not have been possible without the revivalist spirit of Japanese nationalism. It is perhaps also true that the rapid modernization of some European countries, Germany in particular, was facilitated to some extent by the upsurge and thorough diffusion of a nationalist fervor. Judged by present indications, the renaissance of Asia will be brought about through the instrumentality of nationalist movements rather than by other mediums. It was the rise of a genuine nationalist movement which enabled Kemal Ataturk to modernize Turkey almost overnight. In Egypt, untouched by mass movement, modernization is slow and faltering, though its rulers from the day of Mehmed Ali have welcomed Western ideas, and its contacts with the West have been many and intimate. Zionism is an instrument for the renovation of a backward country and the transformation of shopkeepers and brain workers into farmers, laborers, and soldiers. Had Chiang Kai-shek known how to set in motion a genuine mass movement, or at least sustain the nationalist enthusiasm kindled by the Japanese invasion, he might have been acting now as the renovator of China. Since he did not know how, He was easily shoved aside by the masters of the art of religiosity and religiification, the art of turning practical purposes into holy causes. It is not difficult to see why America and Britain, for any Western democracy, could not play a direct and leading role in rousing the Asiatic countries from their backwardness and stagnation. The democracies are neither inclined nor perhaps able to kindle a revivalist spirit in Asia's millions. The contribution of the Western democracies to the awakening of the East has been indirect and certainly unintended. They have kindled an enthusiasm of resentment against the West, and it is this anti-Western fervor which is at present rousing the Orient from its stagnation of centuries. 2. There is in us a tendency to locate the shaping forces of our existence outside ourselves. Success and failure are unavoidably related in our minds with the state of things around us. Hence, it is that people with a sense of fulfillment think it a good world and would like to conserve it as it is, while the frustrated favor radical change. The tendency to look for all causes outside ourselves persists even when it is clear that our state of being is the product of personal qualities such as ability, character, appearance, health, and so on. If anything ail a man, says Thoreau, so that he does not perform his functions, if he have a pain in his bowels even, he forthwith sets about reforming the world. It is understandable that those who fail should incline to blame the world for their failure. The remarkable thing is that the successful too, however much they pride themselves on their foresight, fortitude, thrift, and other sterling qualities, are at bottom convinced that their success is the result of a fortuitous combination of circumstances. The self-confidence of even the consistently successful is never absolute. They are never sure that they know all the ingredients which go into the making of their success. The outside world seems to them a precariously balanced mechanism, and so long as it ticks in their favor, they are afraid to tinker with it. Thus, the resistance to change and the ardent desire for it spring from the same conviction, and the one can be as vehement as the other. 3. Discontent by itself does not invariably create a desire for change. Other factors have to be present before discontent turns into disaffection. 
One of these is a sense of power. Those who are awed by their surroundings do not think of change, no matter how miserable their condition. When our mode of life is so precarious as to make it patent that we cannot control the circumstances of our existence, we tend to stick to the proven and the familiar. We counteract a deep feeling of insecurity by making of our existence a fixed routine. We hereby acquire the illusion that we have tamed the unpredictable. Fisher folk, nomads, and farmers who have to contend with the willful elements, the creative worker who depends on inspiration, the savage awed by his surroundings, they all fear change. They face the world as they would an all-powerful jury. The abjectly poor, too, stand in awe of the world around them and are not hospitable to change. It is a dangerous life we live when hunger and cold are at our heels. There is thus a conservatism of the destitute as profound as the conservatism of the privileged, and the former is as much a factor in the perpetuation of a social order as the latter. The men who rush into undertakings of a vast change usually feel they are in possession of some irresistible power. The generation that made the French Revolution had an extravagant conception of the omnipotence of man's reason and the boundless range of his intelligence. Never, says de Tocqueville, had humanity been prouder of itself, nor had it ever so much faith in its own omnipotence. And joined with this exaggerated self-confidence was a universal thirst for change which came unbidden to every mind. Lenin and the Bolsheviks, who plunged recklessly into the chaos of the creation of a new world, had blind faith in the omnipotence of Marxist doctrine. The Nazis had nothing as potent as that doctrine, but they had faith in an infallible leader and also faith in a new technique. For it is doubtful whether national socialism would have made such rapid progress if it had not been for the electrifying conviction that the new techniques of blitzkrieg and propaganda made Germany irresistible. Even the sober desire for progress is sustained by faith, faith in the intrinsic goodness of human nature and in the omnipotence of science. It is a defiant and blasphemous faith, not unlike that held by the man who set out to build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and who believed that nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. 4. Offhand, one would expect that the mere possession of power would automatically result in a cocky attitude toward the world and a receptivity to change, but it is not always so. The powerful can be as timid as the weak. What seems to count more than possession of instruments of power is faith in the future. Where power is not joined with faith in the future, it is used mainly to ward off the new and preserve the status quo. On the other hand, extravagant hope, even when not backed by actual power, is likely to generate a most reckless daring. For the hopeful can draw strength from the most ridiculous sources of power, a slogan, a word, a button. No faith is potent unless it is also faith in the future, unless it has a millennial component. So too, an effective doctrine, as well as being a source of power, it must also claim to be a key in the book of the future. Those who would transform a nation or the world cannot do so by breeding and captaining discontent, or by demonstrating the reasonableness and desirability of the intended changes, or by coercing people into a new way of life. They must know how to kindle and fan an extravagant hope. It matters not whether it be hope of a heavenly kingdom, of heaven on earth, of plunder and untold riches, of fabulous achievement or world dominion. If the communists win Europe and a large part of the world, it will not be because they know how to stir up discontent or how to infect people with hatred, but because they know how to preach hope. 5. Thus, the differences between the conservative and the radical seem to spring mainly from their attitude toward the future. Fear of the future causes us to lean against and cling to the present, while faith in the future renders us receptive to change. Both the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak, they who have achieved much or little, can be afraid of the future. When the present seems so perfect that the most we can expect from it is its even continuation, 
In the future, change can only mean deterioration. Hence, men of outstanding achievement and those who live full, happy lives usually set their faces against drastic innovation. The conservatism of invalids and people past middle age stems, too, from fear of the future. They are on the lookout for signs of decay and feel that any change is more likely to be for the worse than for the better. The abjectly poor also are without faith in the future. The future seems to them a booby trap buried on the road ahead. One must step gingerly. To change things is to ask for trouble. As for the hopeful, it does not seem to make any difference who it is that is seized with a wild hope, whether it be an enthusiastic intellectual, a land-hungry farmer, a get-rich-quick speculator, a sober merchant or industrialist, a plain working man or a noble lord. They all proceed recklessly with the present, wreck it if necessary, and create a new world. There can thus be revolutions by the privileged as well as by the underprivileged. The movement of enclosure in the 16th and 17th century England was a revolution by the rich. The woolen industry rose to high prosperity and grazing became more profitable than cropping. The landowners drove off their tenants, enclosed the commons and wrought profound changes in the social and economic texture of the country. The lords and nobles were upsetting the social order, breaking down ancient law and custom, sometimes by means of violence, often by pressure and intimidation. Another English revolution by the rich occurred at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. It was the Industrial Revolution. The breathtaking potentialities of mechanization set the minds of manufacturers and merchants on fire. They began a revolution as extreme and radical as ever inflamed the mind of sectarians. And, in a relatively short time, these respectable, God-fearing citizens changed the face of England beyond recognition. When hopes and dreams are loose in the streets, it is well for the timid to lock doors, shutter windows, and lie low until the wrath has passed. For there is often a monstrous incongruity between the hopes, however noble and tender, and the action which follows them. It is as if ivied maidens and garlanded youths were to herald the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 6. For men to plunge headlong into an undertaking of vast change, they must be intensely discontented, yet not destitute. And they must have the feeling that by the possession of some potent doctrine, infallible leader, or some new technique, they have access to a source of irresistible power. They must also have an extravagant conception of the prospects and potentialities of the future. Finally, they must be wholly ignorant of the difficulties involved in their vast undertaking. Experience is a handicap. The men who started the French Revolution were wholly without political experience. The same is true of the Bolsheviks, Nazis, and the revolutionaries in Asia. The experienced man of affairs is a latecomer. He enters the movement when it is already a going concern. It is perhaps the Englishman's political experience that keeps him shy of mass movements.